your colleagues, your friends, members of the Proxy Association. Since we can slowly try to start, I would like to welcome you to this evening event, this second Proxy Ball of 2017. And it is my very, very great pleasure and honor to introduce to you our tonight's speaker, which is Professor Paul Janovic. And I'm really pleased that he is here tonight as a current young Skype fellow. And I will now try to recapitulate very briefly what his scientific achievements uh, and his scientific tracks were that we have brought so far. So I will try to speak like this. Can you hear me? Yeah. Even better. Yeah. Okay. So I will try to raise my voice a little bit. And in case you should, it should fade out, just tell it. So then I will try to write it again. So, so Kurt Lambeck is from the Australian National University where he was appointed as a professor of geophysics in 1977. And he was a director of research school of earth scientists from 1983 to 1993. After an undergraduate education on geography in Australia, graduating in 1962, and as a graduate student in Delft, Athens, and Oxford, where he received his degree in 1967, he worked at the Harvard Smithsonian Observatory in the US first in their satellite geodesy program before he was moving to the Observatory of in 1971 and later to the University of Paris as a professor of geophysics. In recent years, he has held many visiting appointments, including very prestigious chairs in Utrecht, for example, in Sweden and in Paris. His research areas are very diverse, they have spanned a broad spectrum with an overall focus on the interactions between solid earth, the fluid regimes, as a means of understanding how the planet responds to forcing. In this, he has used all available geoscience and genetic tools, including those provided by space programs. And he has written textbooks on these fields, for example, the first one, the Earth's Variable Rotation, Geophysical Causes and Consequences, which was published in 1980, and the second one, Geophysical Geodesy, the Slow Deformations of Earth, which was published in 1988, and just over 300 publications at all. So it's very impressive, I would say. His more recent work has then been on sea level change, it's a very urgent topic nowadays, and its relation with the ice sheets during glacial cycles to study both the Earth's geology and the glacial history of our planet. So also for scientifically very relevant topics, as you will probably hear in the talk very soon. His contributions to the field are outstanding and has been recognized through the election of the number of Academy of Sciences, including the Royal Society in the UK, the French Academy des Sciences, and the US National Academy of Science, and through a number of national and international awards, including the Balsam Prize in 2012 for solid earth sciences with emphasis on interdisciplinary research. He's really an outstanding scientist, and we are very pleased and very honored to welcome him today. He's currently Johann Skype's fellow at EC. That's probably the main reason that he's here, and I'm looking very much forward to your talk about to Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I, hope, <clears throat> I hope I can live up to uh, what he has read out. Um, right. Now, <clears throat> um, can you hear me all right? I, my voice is rather collapsing on me these days. So can you hear me in the back? I'll try and keep it up a little bit. Um, the trouble is the more I try, the worse the problem becomes. Um, sorry, I thought this was set up to start. I'm going to try and do something today that I haven't done for a long time, if ever. Uh, people have generally said that I don't prepare my talks terribly well and I just talk what I think needs to be said. Um, I've decided this time to try and be a little bit more disciplined. And one of the reasons is that I'm sort of going a little bit beyond my, in some cases, beyond my areas of recent uh, experience. And what I really would like to try and do is talk a little bit about where the, uh, how the Earth Observing Program, and particularly the part that I'm most familiar with, the uh, Satellite Geodesy Program, has evolved over my sort of nearly 50 years of working in this field, starting from the uh, very beginning. And in that process, to try and highlight some of the lessons uh, 
uh, that we have learned from that process and perhaps give some of the arguments as to why I think EASY, for example, has made a very wise decision in broadening its program to include aspects of the earth sciences. Because as far as I'm concerned, the two are totally intertwined. We cannot pull them apart, really, if we want to understand the whole earth and planetary system. I'm going to try and do this by dividing my talk up into three parts. Essentially, the first decade or so of the space program, uh, which was characterized by a concept of very much a static Earth, an Earth that didn't do a great deal, wasn't terribly exciting. And then the second phase from about the early mid 1970s until the beginning of this millennium, when we started to see the first time dependent uh, behavior of the Earth on geodetic and uh, time scales. And the importance of this, of course, is that it sort of bridges that gap between the seismological information on the one hand and the geological information on the other. And I'll return to that. And then the third phase is really what's happened, the exciting period for the last 15 years or so, when the uh, vision of the late 1960s, as I'll explain a little bit later, was actually realized and we've gone, entered into this very exciting period of the new uh, space missions that are giving us a totally new look at the Earth. And we really can no longer talk about the Earth on its own. We have to talk about the Earth system, the interactions between the Earth and all its fluid um, uh, spheres. So that's what I'm going to sort of try and do. Now, by my very nature, I should put out a warning. It's, it'll be a somewhat personal view, uh, I suspect, areas that I've worked on. Uh, if I've left out any areas that you think are more important, I apologize for that. And you can tell me about that later on. Now, I came into the field at, I, start, I went to university in the late 50s, just at the time when the first satellites were going up. Um, and I entered into a program of uh, a geodesy program in the days when the objective of geodesy was essentially mapping. And that was very pertinent in Australia at that time, of course. Uh, but I was, I suspect, smart enough to see that that was uh, a bit of a dead end area and that I needed to look at some of the developments that were being uh that were sort of coming uh, that were be being talked about in a general way that were coming from the first satellites that were being launched now at the time i was bonded to work with our state government they paid me through university so i was expected to work for them uh, but when i expressed interest in uh you know, considering how we could use the satellite analysis that was then just starting off to improve the mapping of Australia, I was told that that was pie in the sky. And if that's what I wanted to do, I better leave. So wisely, I did leave um, and um, got involved in the satellite program. And I worked with, uh, initially with the cameras, the Bacon on camera, a very powerful camera for tra access tracking system that was used to track the satellites. And if I hadn't done that, I probably would have been doing that sort of thing. And I'm glad I took the made the choice that I did. So um, I, um, when I graduated, I paid off my bond. I had to work for a year to earn some money to do that. But then I uh, left uh, to the Northern Hemisphere uh, graduate studies in several places to do what I really, where I really felt the future was. And you know, for the young ones amongst you, when old people try to give you advice, listen carefully, but don't necessarily follow it. Pay, consider it carefully. And that includes anything that I may say, because I now am older than those people who gave me bad advice. One of the very earliest things and unexpected things that 
well, perhaps not an unexpected, some people may have anticipated this, but one of the very earliest things that came out of the satellites, literally within weeks of the first launch of the Sputnik satellite, was a much improved estimate of the Earth's uh, flattening. The flattening of the Earth was a, uh, a fundamental concept in geodesy. The Earth was, a, in the long term, was a fluid, and the shape of the Earth should be a, a follow that of hydrostatic equilibrium. And very quickly, within a very short period of time, that was proved wrong. And this was followed not long after by the next step in this development, the so-called pear-shaped Earth. The name was given by Desmond King Healy, who played an important role in that he was able to gather optical observations. He lined up all sorts of schoolboys in various public schools in Britain to observe these satellites. And from that, he put together a database that people then used to determine the first departures of the Earth's shape from what everybody really had expected. And that was only a year after the first satellites went up. So things were moving very quickly and very unexpectedly. Some of you may remember this, um, this, period, this period. The next step only a year or so later by uh, Yoshida Kozai. A lot of this work was done at the Smithsonian Harvard Observatories at that time, where he was able, actually able to look at the longitudinal dependence of the Earth's gravity field expressed here as the geoid and equipotential surface. Now, these pictures are all sort of from that period. We didn't worry about colored photographs, colored pictures, fancy publications. Uh, we tended to produce our results and publish them and deal with the uh, uh, the artwork that we see in the modern publications. Uh, but you begin to see here, with a bit of squinting, the early uh, signals of the Earth's gravity field that we still see today. Um, for example, is this actually... Uh, a pointer? Is this meant to be a pointer or? No, no, no. I, I go get you. Now. Okay. So it's a plus probably the recording yeah. system that I've made a mess of. <laughs> okay. But anyway, here, sort of south of India, for example, there's a great depression in the geoid of something like 50, 55, 60 meters. And over the northern end of Australia, for example, there's something like 65 meters. Now, in a sense, uh, what does this tell you? It tells you that the Earth doesn't follow the concept of hydrostatic equilibrium. And at the time, it created a lot of debate. It's a rather simple observation, and there was a lot of virulent debate. And there were three um explanations that were widely discussed there's a concept that the earth was rigid and that it really showed the condition of origin that what we were seeing today was really what the earth was like several billion years ago and that it hadn't changed very much and i was very much driven by a very distinguished geophysicist at the time sir harold jeffries and he did not budge from that particular position the other one was the opposite one, uh, the concept that this had to indicate that the Earth had to be uh, dynamic. Things had to be going on inside of the Earth to support the sort of density anomalies, to support the stress differences that would be created within the planet by, uh, by these sort of geoid anomalies. And that was driven very much by both uh, some of the geophysics physicists, Keith Runcorn, for example, and uh, Kopal, uh, a well uh, distinguished astronomer at the time, who both argued strongly that the Earth was uh, much more fluid. Sorry. Yeah, that's, that looks more promising. That the Earth was much more fluid, and that the existence of these anomalies that were beginning to appear were indicative of mantle convection. 
And there was a third school, and perhaps I shouldn't say this, but it was mainly driven by uh, the German school of jealousy, which said, look, this is all wrong. This is all nonsense, you guys. You don't know what you're doing. They would have said it more politely, but the earth is in hydrostatic equilibrium. And this sort of thing that we just saw cannot possibly occur. Well, times were moving on because this was occurring in the early 60s. And as some of you may recall, this was the time when concepts of seafloor spreading first started to appear in the literature, the situation where the ocean uh, floor, uh, the North Atlantic, for example, the big ridge system was discovered and the concept that the ocean floor was expanding there. And of course, if something expands somewhere, something's got to go down somewhere else, unless you believe in expanding Earth. And this led in the late 60s to the concept of the plate tectonics hypothesis driven independently and complementary by three individuals and in those days this sort of work was very much a work of individuals Xavier Le Pichon for example in Paris uh, Jason Morgan in the US and Dan McKenzie in the UK and that simple system of plate tectonics really incorporated all the geological observations all the geophysical observations that we had in those days in that day and we couldn't really create independent tests of the hypothesis because everything we knew about the earth was had gone into building up the hypothesis i don't think i need to describe to you what the plate tectonics hypothesis was all about except to simply say the plates, uh, the lithosphere, the upper 100 kilometers so of uh, the Earth is fairly cold, fairly rigid, and it was divided into plates that could move more or less rigidly, and the motion being made possible by the creation of new lithosphere at the ocean ridges, for example, here, and the subduction or destruction of lithosphere at the uh, subduction zones where you now see deep trenches and this was a hypothesis that that worked uh, remarkably well but of course it required an engine to drive it one of the important features of the plate tectonics hypothesis is that it carried the continents along with within the lithosphere so it, it replaced the older concept of continental drift the, where the continents were moving relative to each other, replaced it with a situation where the continents were simply passive components in these lithospheric plates. And that sort of uh, development by the three that I've mentioned occurred at exactly the same time where the next big jump, next big improvement occurred in our understanding of the gravity field, one that I was intimately involved with in the late 60s at the Smithsonian. And that's what the geoid, the equipotential surface, looked like according to our models at that particular time. The uh, pink ones, areas of <clears throat> negative values below, th these are, this is reference with respect to the ellipsoid to some sort of mean ellipsoid, best fitting ellipsoid. And the here the geoid lies below the ellipsoid in the blue, it lies above that. And similar sort of amplitudes, 100 meters here south of India, 75 meters here over Papua New Guinea, for example. The Icelandic ridge showing up as a positive um, and so forth. All sorts of interesting features begin to appear. And the importance, um, I should perhaps just, you may see a resemblance of some shapes. King Healy at the time, Desmond King Healy, described this as the goat of, of the Americas talking to the wise man over Eurasia. And that sort of pattern really persisted uh, until this very day. So I think that was a, a major step forward. And what we, um, 
what its importance was in the context of the plate tectonics uh, hypotheses, that it to a very close degree followed what was predicted from the hypothesis. The positive anomalies over the spreading zone resulting from both the, the combination of the rising columns in the mantle hot material, but primarily what you're seeing here is the upward deflection of the lithosphere underneath that rising column, bringing the mass closer to the uh, surface. The highs over the Andes, for example, the, um, uh, the sort of sharp contrast at the edges here corresponding to the Pacific plates. And these are features that we'll see later come out or borne out more sharply. But uh, this was became then for a long time the main evidence that mantle convection occurred and that that mantle convection, that the mantle convection was required to support the stresses associated with, we could calculate what these stress fields look like, the magnitudes of them, and, um, and take it from there. The methods that we had at our hands in those days were very simple. They were essentially observations of the satellites tracked from the ground, primarily by cameras at this point. Uh, the laser tracking came in shortly afterwards, uh, measuring the satellite positions when the satellite was illuminated by the sun and the camera obviously was in darkness, so the opportunities for observing were rather limited. And the precisions were fairly limiting because you had to calculate the satellite position relative to star catalog positions and all that sort of complications that made it the reduction of the data a bit of a nightmare. Uh, but um, it presented the sort of major limitation to how far these methods could go. And I've tried to illustrate this here in the next picture, a sort of a cartoon. This is the only equation I'll show uh, just to explain that the standard process normally has been to take the gravitational potential and to expand it in spherical harmonics. And uh, each harmonic is associated with a certain wave number L that determines the wavelength of that particular harmonic. And if you take that um, potential and extrapolate it up to the uh, altitudes of the satellites and ask yourself which harmonics can we expect to be able to observe in our spectrum of uh, orbital perturbations, we get something like this. If we had one meter type tracking data, good, uh, pretty good coverage, we could determine all these harmonics up to a degree at about 16 or 18, just where our solutions finished up. And there's a cluster of harmonics here through a resonance analysis that I needn't worry about. And if you push the tracking accuracy up to about 50 centimeters, as it came, uh, became some years later with a greater introduction of laser ranging, you could push it up to about 22, 23, and if 20 centimeters, possibly up to about 25. But you see, it was a diminishing returns. And it took really the next 10 years to push the field from 16 to about sort of 25, for example. And so what we, the situation we had in about 1970 is illustrated here. I've just plotted up schematically the accuracy of our tracking systems as a function of time. And we were essentially seeing this sort of progression. Over a 10 year period, we saw a good, almost two orders of magnitude improvement in our tracking, uh, primarily from the improvement of the camera observations, the introduction of the laser observations. Now, I should emphasize, and I should perhaps have said that earlier, um, our work was very much driven by the civilian program, by NASA and the collaboration with mainly European countries for establishing, expanding the uh, network. There was, of course, the parallel military program about which the which was guarded very very carefully in those days and i can 
tell some interesting stories about the conflicts, but never mind. Uh, and that's is shown here by the Doppler, and that you'll be familiar with the uh, transit system that started already in the early 60s and improved in quality and was to continue on until the 1980s. That did produce a lot of good data, good information, but that was only released decades later. So one didn't know about that. And my principal argument that I used with when we had conflicts of uh, security and classification was to say, you know, let us publish our solutions because anybody who's half intelligent will think that the classified ones are much better, whereas I actually knew that they weren't. Um, this was on the early laser systems that was developed uh, by the Goddard Space Flight Center for tracking satellites. These, of course, had much greater accuracy potentials, but uh, they were also limited by the fact, at least early on, that the satellite had to be visible and uh, the lasers, the ground tracking stations, had to be in darkness. So you can only see small parts of the orbit as the satellite comes over. That, of course, improved with time. So that's essentially where we were at that concept, at that end of that phase one. We've gone through a period of essentially dismantling the concept of the Earth being essentially static, not changing, not evolving with time, at least not on geodetic or um, time scales, um, to one where we were beginning to see evidence for a relationship between our geodetic results and the geophysical sciences. And that was probably the first time that that really happened. Now, in just summarizing it so far, I've glossed over many other important developments, of course. One, a parallel one that came out of the satellite program was, of course, the use of the uh, was the, uh, development of models for atmospheric densities, for example. Because one another reason that I haven't mentioned why our methods were limited is that the satellites were subject to non-gravitational forces as well as gravitational forces, namely or most importantly, the atmospheric drag. So that had to be extracted from the orbital analysis as well. And that led to people like Luigi Giacchia, for example, developing very complete models of the atmospheric density with some of its major seasonal and sub-seasonal uh, variations. So let's enter <clears throat> into the uh, second phase, this emerging, this period of <clears throat> where we're beginning to see the actual time dependence in the Earth's behavior. The transition from phase one to phase two actually came about or was the result largely of a very important document that was published in 1969, which we refer to as the Williamstown document, which was a brainstorming session of physicists, geophysicists primarily, uh, and technologists uh, to see what could be done in the near future with our existing technologies as they stood at that time. What sort of instrument, uh, instrumental capability could be developed? What sort of science could be done? And this proposal, it's hard to find, but um, I can give people a PDF because it's really worth reading. I give it to some of my students and they look at me in amazement. They say, how did you know all this back in 69? You know, we're only just beginning to understand it. So there's a lot of profound information in that document. And the table of contents or the partial table of contents gives some of the, some idea of the scope. And if you just look at the technology, we see a number of familiar and, or then familiar and futuristic looking features. The camera tracking, of course, and the recommendation there was that that was going to be phased out, which it was a few years later. The laser ranging tracking, which was going to need to further development the introduction of the long baseline interferometry developed by the radio astronomers but applying it to geodetic methods, the satellite altimetry, a new concept in the mid-60s, 
turn to that in a moment, the drag free satellites in which the satellites could be freed of the perturbing effects of the atmospheric drag and therefore they could be lowered and therefore they would become much more sensitive to the geopotential. The possibility of increasing the coverage of tracking the satellites along their orbits using satellite to satellite ranging techniques either between two low satellites and of course that is the prototype for the um, GRACE mission that I'll touch on towards the end and also by going from low orbiters to high orbiters something like geostationary satellites which became the prototype for one of the uh, lunar gravity missions the Japanese mission a decade or two later so all sorts of things were already being heralded here which were going to be uh, have important consequences various radar techniques, uh, the importance of developing a much better monitoring capability of the troposphere and ionosphere, both for very good application reasons, of course, for meteorology and for space weather prediction, but also for improving the ability to uh, improving our orbital, our uh, tracking capability. The importance of being able to transfer time from one place to another at the micro and sub second level was also recognized as very important and something that was an integral part of achieving these sort of goals. And then finally, the icing on the cake was really the recommendation that we should explore the use of gravimeters and radiometers in space. And that, of course, came about with the Boche mission of uh, ESA not that long ago. So a whole lot of futuristic uh, developments were occurring uh, at this point. And the scientific goals in this uh, rather poor quality slide, but again, it reflects the past. We did things on typewriters. We didn't have word processes in those days. But essentially, the scientific goals very much focusing on the dynamics of the solid Earth. The word dynamics creeps in recognition that it's going to be a long-term one. The oceans creep in for the first time, that the geodetic measurements are going to provide information on the circulation of the oceans. Earthquake mechanisms that, of course, was very topical at that time because of the whole plate tectonics uh, models. And there was a recognition that the seismological the spectrum that the seismologists could observe had to be expanded, that one had to be able to see deformations of the Earth before and after earthquakes on longer time periods. And the thought was that the satellite data may be able to provide that ocean atmosphere interactions, geomagnet magnetism, of course, energy back to the oceans again, and the whole rotational dynamics of the Earth system. So it was a very exciting time to be involved in the program at the time, particularly as um, the pr uh, prediction on the timescale required to achieve most of those results was only about five years. They said with the right level of funding, the right political climate, we can do these things within the next five years because nothing that we are proposing is beyond the present day, the then present day technological capability and nothing in the scientific objectives was really far beyond what we intrinsically knew about uh, the earth, about geophysics. And also at that time, uh, or I've moved on a little bit here now, the tracking accuracy is also improving to continue to provide the underpinning. Now, to me, well, the thing that happened, of course, was this was still at the height of the Cold War. Um, the um, budgetary constraints in the US put an end to the development of the program on any reasonable time scale, and aspects of the program ran foul of um, uh, the military who weren't under any circumstances prepared to let the civilian program develop altimeters, for example. Fortunately, 
that changed some years later. And one of the missions that was planned already for the late 60s, the GEOS Ultimatum mission, actually went up in the late, in the mid 1970s. But for me, that had was of some importance because I was faced with a situation where lots of, I could see lots of exciting things coming out of this program that I wanted to, to work on. And on the other hand, I could see having to wait 10 years, 15 years, perhaps even longer if the route that was going on at the time was going to continue. And uh, fortunately, uh, the French program had started up by then and they'd invited me to spend a year in Paris to help them to uh, set up some of the things that I'd learned in the US and transfer that to them. And also to start thinking about some of the applications, the geophysical side of the interpretation side of things. Now, I discovered very quickly when I got to France, there was nothing I could teach the French about orbital mechanics, etc. They knew this much better than I did. Uh, they may not have had the practical experience, but you know, that's easily transferred. And I was really left to my own devices to develop the uh, geophysics program uh, that underpinned the satellite geology program there. And very quickly, I came to the sort of uh, to um, to a goal that really was going to determine what I would do for the next uh, few decades. And that was <clears throat> to address this important question of what are the parameters, what are the key parameters that we need to know to, uh, to drive the mantle convection process. And the key one, in a sense, was the mantle viscosity. We had a good understanding of the elastic behavior of the Earth from the seismic data. And we had a reasonable sort of uh, understanding that on very, very long time periods, the Earth, because the fact that the Earth did have a flattening that was fairly close to the hydrostatic value, but not quite the same, uh, that the, on the very long time scales, the Earth behaved essentially as a fluid. And the question, of course, is, how did that transition occur from elastic behavior to fluid behavior? Now, the Earth is subject to a whole range of forces on all sorts of time scales from subhertz to the age of the Earth. And each one of those forces, forcings on the Earth has left a variety of signals in the geophysical, geological, historical records of the Earth. And I set myself sort of for the group, essentially, this goal of where we're going to, where we're going to look at the part in between the seismic and the very long time uh, term geological parts of the spectrum. And these include the tidal band, uh, periods of 12 hours up to as long as 19 years, the mutation tide. There's the rotational spectrum, the uh, seasonal variations in the Earth's rotation extending to decadal scales. And on the thousands of years, there is the glacial rebound. I'll touch upon some of those as I uh, progress. And then on the long time scale, we have the tectonics uh, uh, records, um, how the Earth responds to, for example, to the formation of large deltas, how it responds to the formation, the loading of the Earth's surface by, uh, by the uh, um, uh, volcanic uh, loads. And at the time, I was about as optimistic as the Williamstown group was in thinking, well, we could knock that over in five years. And here I am still talking about some parts of this spectrum. Um, so we we had to pick our problems. We, could, we were a very small group. And uh, in fact, one of the people who worked on that is now the director of the geophysics program here at EC. So that's something I'm very pleased about. Um, and the, one of the first ones we looked at was the tidal deformations. Now, you're all familiar with the ocean tides, uh, perhaps less familiar with the fact that the solid Earth is undergoing um, 
tidal deformations as well on the same sorts of frequencies. Deformations that in terms of the gravitational effects on satellites is very much larger than the ocean part. Some of the very earlier, this was recognized by uh, Kozai and uh, Robert Newton uh, already in the mid 60s and they produced some early numbers, but they weren't particularly satisfactory in part because again, limitations of the tracking data, orbital coverage was poor, quality of the data was poor, and uh, because the fact that ocean tides were also important was really sort of overlooked. These people were celestial me mechanicians, so you can, understand, you can forgive them for that. For, um, and, um, but by the sort of early 70s, there had been enough data collected to be able to do a much better job. Now, I'm not going to go into the details. They are fairly classical satellite mechanics developments that we carried out. But I'm just going to mention a couple of the results that came out of that because they show one of the links again with sort of planetary work. The um, tides raised on the Earth, uh, I think, as, as you know, um, have this consequence on the lunar orbit in which the moon is accelerated in its uh, orbit in, in longitude um, and that's been known by astronomers for for the best part of a century or more and it has as consequence that the moon is gradually moving away from the earth at a rate of a few centimeters a year and the key problem in those days was well, if you take these numbers that the astronomers produce and you extrapolate them back into time, then the, uh, then the moon must have come out of the Earth somewhere around about typically 2 billion years ago. And George Howard Darwin, for example, suggested that the Pacific uh, Ocean, the basin there, was really uh, part of the Earth that had been torn out by the formation of the Moon because of some sort of close encounter that would have occurred at that time. Uh, and this became this catastrophic uh, event uh, became known as the Gaston Corn event, a time when the Moon would have passed close to the Earth if it was captured from a, some sort of asteroid or some other uh, non-terrestrial body captured by the Earth and then evolved out under this tidal evolution process. The problems with that is when you do the calculations, you finish up with tides on the Earth of kilometer type amplitudes, both the solid tides and the ocean tides. And that would surely have left a very clear record in the um, geological record. And of course, the other very major problem was that the Apollo program came along, brought the rocks back and the chemistry of the moon was totally inconsistent with um, uh, with that capture hypothesis. So we wondered about what can we do to try and understand that problem a bit better. And the sort of questions we asked was, can we track is the because the mechanism is the same, the satellite perturbations raised by the tides from the satellite perturbations caused by the tides is essentially the same mechanics as what happened to the moon. If we observe what happens to the artificial satellites, can we extrapolate those parameters to the moon and see if that agrees with the astronomical observations, for example. So that was a, in itself an interesting exercise requiring to delve into eclipse records of the astro, uh, of, uh, records of past eclipses in order to uh, extend the astronomical record back on time, there's a vast literature on that. And then the other question became, because we very quickly noticed that different satellites, depending on their inclination, gave very different tidal numbers, what we call love numbers, uh, depending on the inclination. And we were able to demonstrate very quickly that was really the effect of the ocean tide. So we had to introduce into our orbital mechanics models for ocean tides and the time dependence of these. And it turned out that some of the key parameters in those tidal expansions 
were identical to the ones that control the history of the moon. So we had three new things. We had the satellite numbers, we had the moon numbers from the laser ranging program, we had astronomical data, and we had a better insight into the dissipation of energy into the oceans. And we were essentially able to put that together and come up with a very coherent story, which essentially is shown in this little summary here at the bottom, where the acceleration of the moon in longitude in its orbit is the astronomical estimates about 28 uh, seconds, arc seconds per century squared. The satellite estimates gave a very consistent number. The numerical tide estimates gave a similar number, possibly a little bit greater. And then the lunar laser ranging estimates gave a similar number again, all within the error bars. And remember, these were all the first sort of numbers that came out. And from this, we were able to draw the conclusion that most of the tidal energy occurred, uh, most of the dissipation of tidal energy does not incur, occur in the solid earth, as had been currently, then currently believed, but really took place in the oceans, and that the viscosity of the earth uh, at, the at the lunar tidal frequencies was not uh, terribly important but the dissipation in the oceans were. And the moment you assume, you conclude that, and you have become aware that continents have moved around, the ocean configurations have changed, and therefore the tidal dissipation can no longer be assumed to have been constant. And we were, able to do, we were able to do some models to illustrate the sort of changes that were required, sort of changes in configuration to avoid this close encounter to, to avoid this Gaston Corn event, an, an event that would have been made Ragnarok, for those who are familiar with the Norse legends, look like a pretty trivial event. Um, they talk about tides, etc., being high during that event, but they would have been orders of magnitude larger. The other reason why I just picked on the tide example, uh, geophysically perhaps not the most important, but an interesting one, is that these tidal studies can now also be, do be done for the satellites, for the uh, terrestrial planets and the terrestrial satellites. And while for the Earth, the tidal numbers do not tell us much about the Earth because we have much better sources of information, for the planets, this is often the best we have. And the numbers that you get will, uh, will be modeled, how you interpret them is model dependent, but they'll give you some idea of whether the moon has, uh, whether the other planet has a fluid core or not. Venus, for example, has a value not so different from that for the Earth. For the solid Earth, it's about 0.3. Assuming the chemistry of the bulk chemistry is about the same for the, sorry, that's Venus there, for the two planets is about the same you could conclude immediately from that simple single number that it's very likely that uh, Venus has a liquid core. For Mars, in con contrast, the numbers are quite a bit lower. Sorry, that should be 1.5 to 2, uh, point, uh, 0 0.15 to 0 0.2, not 2. And this is generally interpreted in terms of the if there is a core in Mars at all, and if it's fluid, it has to be very much smaller than for the other planets. Mercury, we don't, to my knowledge, have numbers for yet, but theoretical calculations suggest that the numbers would be higher, and it would be nice to be able to measure the tidal oscillations of Mercury to test those uh, Earth models that have gone into that. And for the Moon, the numbers are very low and any core in the moon has to be small on the basis that I have said, but keep in mind, always Earth uh, model parameters, um, model dependence. Now, in sort of going so far, um, sorry, I just need to take stock as to where I am in my, Yeah. Um, also, at this time, 
uh, I haven't done, I haven't mentioned in this period, this intermediate period where we're beginning to see the Earth's deformation. Other important developments occurred, the, which I'm not going to talk about um, other than just mention the Earth's rotation, uh, which had been observed by astronomers with fairly limited uh, precision and resolution. It's a very complicated measurement, so it's understandable. And now could be measured directly from the satellites. The satellites um, moving in an inertial space, and if somehow you can track the motion of your ground stations in that space, you can actually determine the rotation of that network in space, and that gives you the measure of the Earth's rotation. And those measurements are coming into play, and they were beginning to provide new information on uh, both the changes in the speed of rotation and in the so-called polar wonder, the movement of the rotation axis with, the, uh, with respect to the crust. At the time, that was a particularly exciting possibility because it had been suggested by uh, two Canadians, Benzina and Smiley, that the very large earthquakes could actually excite this, the free mutations of the Earth, the free oscillations of the Earth, and that from uh, Earth observations, you should be able to provide constraints on the earthquakes themselves, and possibly even on any precursory uh, behavior. Unfortunately, that hasn't borne, been borne out so much. The, obs the observations in the beginning weren't accurate enough. The observations today are accurate enough. There have been large earthquakes, but none of them have really, with demonstrable, with conviction, been able to demonstrate they can uh, excite the free mutations. But the question remains open. Um, other important developments at this time was the long period, um, the changes in the Earth's dynamical flattening, um, the fact that the J2 was found not to be constant with time, the value was changing imperceptibly, but enough to be able to measure it over a period of a decade or two. And this is largely the result of the melting or was believed to have been the result of the melting of the large uh, last past ice sheets. And I'll touch on that a little bit later because that's getting close to my own areas of work. But uh, the motion of tectonic plates and the deformation at the plate boundaries for other areas that were beginning to produce preliminary results. But they all sort of stumbled on very much the same problem that there was no single process that was producing the perturbations in our orbit, the perturbations in our coordinate systems, etc. It was always a combination of things. And how do you sort of come to some sort of understanding of this, particularly when some of the perturbing factors are coming from the atmosphere, they're coming from the oceans, uh, coming from, as we see today, from the uh, surface water redistributions. How can we unscramble all of this from the geodetic data alone? And this was one of the sort of recognitions that led us to realize that <clears throat> we couldn't go alone with the geodesy aspects of the program, that we really needed to have much more insight into the fluid parts of the Earth. And of course, that led to that uh, to the sort of endorsement, if you like, of what was already said in the Williamstown uh, document. This picture here, which unfortunately is not terribly clear here, shows you some of the complexities. For example, just for one case, if we want to understand the Earth's rotation, and I've plotted here the schematic freak, uh, diagram of the changes in the length of day as a function of frequency. And the observation spectrum looks something like this with BIPs annual terms, very low frequency, decadal type scale changes, seasonal changes, monthly tidal changes. And this was very much where the situation was in 1980, if we ignored a bit of the red line there. Uh, the error spectrum, the error spectra 
were shown here, for example, until about 1955, the error spectra was here, and all you could see was this part here. Introduction of atomic time in the, uh, after about the mid 1950s, improved the determination of the length of day very significantly, and was now limited only by the astronomical telescope observations, and we could see seasonal terms appearing and the first signs of the tidal. And then with the, uh, I say here expected, this is a slide from 1980, uh, the long baseline interferometry was expected to push that error spectrum further over. And where, where we are today is somewhere on, on this line here with the modern methods. And the question is, what is arising out of that spectrum? What are we going to be seeing in the years ahead that we could only guess at before because it was hidden below the, it was below the noise level of our observations. But what the sort of things that I would be looking for, if I have my time again, I would be looking at precursory signals to large earthquakes, for example. I would be looking to see if there is any, um, if there are any sort of rapid changes in the geomagnetic field that can change the coupling between the core and the mantle, as many people have suggested over a long period of time, but has never really been tested. But I fear that if I, I'd have to be naive to start doing that, because I would find that the whole climate spectrum would be dominating that uh, of what is actually observed, and that the geophysical solid earth signals that probably will still be buried in not measurement noise, but now into the noise generated by the fluid earth but that gives opportunities to learn things about that fluid earth and that's been the progression of this science um, the progression of the tracking capabilities in, continued on its very march we're looking now somewhere like the 1950s 1990s for example and we were down to sort of centimeter range the laser ranges systems and uh, by about 1990, it in theory was down to about one centimeter. I stopped drawing this diagram in two. I did drew this diagram in 2000, and it stopped there because I just couldn't see the point of going any further. But there were two important parts: this important, almost decadal improvement in tracking accuracy every 10 years or so, and also the time it took to get our coordinate systems accurate. In the beginning, the early days, it took observations over a five-year period, did all the analysis, all the massaging to get our reference frame solutions. By 1970, we could do it within about a year. 1980, it was a little bit better than a year. And now we are in that day period. And what that really meant was <coughs> that the we could determine our reference frames at increasingly shorter intervals, so we could begin to see the changes in those reference frames. Now, one of the exciting developments that occurred, one, uh, oh, well, let me go back a step and introduce it differently. The um, holy grail of geodesy for a long time had really been to be able to measure the plate motions, to measure this continental drift, I should say, because it started off measurement of continental drift. And some of you may be aware of the uh, thinking of Alfred Wegener when he developed his uh, continental drift hypothesis. And he had uh, available to him observations Sorry, I'm going, I'm running way behind time. He had available to him observations from very early astronomical observation that he concluded with absolute certainty that Greenland and Denmark were separated by something like 32 meters per year. The data was revised, the introduction of the telegraph was introduced, and in 1927, the number was down, graded to 20 
meters per year. New geodetic instruments came in and, was, and it was concluded that measurement was impossible. It was below the noise level. And that's more or less where things stayed for the next or best part of 80 years until in the early 90s, the VLBI, the long baseline interferometry that I measured, produced really the first results demonstrating that plate motions were occurring. This was a measurement between Massachusetts and West Southern Germany, and it showed that over a 10 year period or so, the continents, the two continents, had drifted apart at a rate of about 12 millimeters per year due to the spreading at the ridge here. And the more recent measurements from GPS here, for example, show a spreading rate of about 18 millimeters per year. A spreading rate of about 18 millimeters per year, the separation occurring here on the Icelandic ridge. Uh, this result was from a few years back. Unfortunately, it hasn't changed since. So I think we've reached a consensus now of, of that the geodetic measurements uh, finally beginning to provide some constraint on the um, plate tecton on the rates of move movement of the plate tectonics movements. This result was remarkably in that it was almost entirely unnoticed by the community because by that time everybody was so convinced that plate tectonics occurred that continents were moving at the rate of centimeters per year that the urgency of proving it didn't seem to be uh, there anymore. To me, the observation and from other observations that were beginning to accumulate, I think we skip through that quickly. Um, no, perhaps I won't because I'll only get confused. Uh, the remarkable thing was that <clears throat> the um, rates were very consistent with the geological rates and average over 10 years was pretty well the same as an average over 3 million years. Now, at first glance, when you think that's at first glance, that's surprising when you think about the inertia in the Earth convective system, it's not terribly surprising that as rigid bodies displace, these rates have to be fairly uniform. But to me, what I found <laughs> astonishing was the good agreement, which showed that both the geological data and the geodetic data were presumably of very good uh, accuracy and that we could begin to compare the two data set, sets on these vastly different timescales. I think that was an important realization at that time. So let me very quickly go into the next phase and I'll try to be, go through this quick and faster because you'll be familiar with a lot of this. The so -called, what I call the dynamic earth system period from about 2000 and beyond. And this came about primarily, this has come about primarily through three types of missions. The global navigation satellite system, we now call it, we give it that longer name rather than GPS because of the other competing and, uh, and uh, complementary systems that have been developed by ESA, by the Russians, by the Chinese now. Um, on the one hand, that was the one major developer and essentially to be very brief about it it enables us now in real time to position ourselves at millimeter accuracy on a daily type basis that's the sort of results that come out from careful gps observations for geodetic purposes geodetic purposes the other important development was the satellite to satellite tracking concept uh, from the what's now known as the grace mission to low orbiting satellites tracking each other, measuring the differential velocities between them, which relates to the potential, gravitational potential. And then the radar altimeter missions that started with the GOC. Sorry, I'm, I've been looking at the wrong part of my screen. Sorry about that. You can see the, the three missions that I just mentioned. The, Move on there, the GPS satellite up there, the GRACE satellite, and the JSON satellite of Kinesti. Important, something I should have mentioned, an important point, I think, of the delays that occurred after the Williamstown document are twofold. One is that it gave time for the 
engineers to think about some of the things that we were talking about doing and it gave them the opportunity to develop much better instrumentation of course so that while the goals were all met they were met with probably two orders of magnitude better accuracy and the other important part was that it gave the european program time to catch up in the 19 even in the mid 1990s late 19 no, sorry, in the mid 1970s, early 1980s, the European programs tended to train very much behind the uh, US driven program. But that changed, of course. And uh, that has only been for the better, because it's important to emphasize the French mis mission, uh, at least French involvement in the Poseidon Top Topex mission, the first really successful attempt to mission, the subsequent Jason satellites. The Grace one, the joint NASA German development, the um, Galileo system, which is better than the GPS system once it's fully operational. But, you know, again, a European endeavor. And I think that's been a very important development recognized by all parties. Now, some of you will say I'm missing out on possibly one of the most exciting developments that's happened in the last few years. And that is the use of INSA, the Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar for measuring displacement fields uh, on the Earth at the time, for example, of earthquakes, at the time of volcanic eruptions, anything that moves in a sort of semi-coherent way on the Earth's surface on periods from minutes to days to weeks. And I just showed that the reason I've skipped over that is because to me, this is very much a black box technology. I do not really understand uh, how they get these marvelous results out of it but essentially what the results are these fringes these color changes each fringe corresponds to in this particular case a displacement of about 2.8 uh, centimeters and what we see here is the earth as viewed before and after the L'Aquila earthquake and you see the displacement field that occurred and you can see the uh, essentially what happened here. This is the fault here. This is where the fault was, an ancient fault was reactivated at the time of the earthquake. And this sort of picture is, I think, becoming increasingly used together with seismic data and with GPS data to build very comprehensive models of the earthquake displacement field to try and understand the mechanisms of rupture of earthquakes, because I think that's the key problem. If we are ever going to understand earthquakes in the future, we have to understand those rupture mechanisms. But I gloss over that simply because of my own ignorance. And you'll also add to that, thank goodness, because the time wouldn't allow it. Let me just, one document you can't read here, I put that up because it's a very historic document, 19, uh, 67, I think the date was, where Kness proposed a system that was essential that would have actually become the GPS system in those days. Unfortunately, they didn't pursue it for a number of years, and it became what's known as the Doris system, one of the workhorses for many of the French and European uh, programs where precise orbits are required. Um, the, um, let me skip over, this is just a picture of the state of what the GPS has produced in terms of measuring the movements of the plates. And essentially what you see are movements, for example, this plate, the Australian plate relative to the Pacific plate of the order of many centimeters per year. You see very coherent pictures, the North American plates sort of rotating as it's being subducted here, pushed by the spreading here, for example. Europe sort of moving away, Africa sort of converging into Europe, etc. All the standard pictures that we would expect from our plate tectonics hypothesis, but now measured virtually on a daily basis and any changes can be seen in this. Now, this next slide is an interesting one, I think, from my own perspective. We have here the trainnet system the first station that I visited in the early 60s filled the room almost as large as this with electronics 
and you have to sit around for a year to get meter accuracy. Now we have the smallest GPS receiver sitting on somebody's thumb here, and here it's being used to track, attached to a bird to track the flight of birds. So GPS, you, you all know about it, probably few of, of us actually understand what goes on in the system, but it's a remarkable system that's, you know, that, that's ubiquitous in everything we do. You know, if you caught the bus here, you knew when the bus was coming by your signboard because of the GPS. Uh, if your phone is switched on, somebody will know where you are within a few meter accuracy, et cetera, et cetera. And um, this is um, leading to a lot of uh, applications areas that we can only begin to, well, we, we speculate on it on a regular basis. Let me sort of go and just do this next one. And this one is worth just dwelling on a little bit. This is Japan here, as you can see, in uh, 2011, just before the big earthquake on March there. And that is where it was located later on. And this is a network of GPS stations that were operating normally on that uh, basis. And the earth, and I'm going to now show you what happened when the earthquake occurred. The um, time the earthquake itself triggered 46 minutes, 16 seconds, when this star becomes red. And then you'll see the first wave arriving on shore along the coast here, about 40, 30 seconds later. And then you'll see the earth heaving up and down by meter type amplitudes for the next couple of minutes. I want to run the whole thing, but so nothing initially, nothing much happens. You see the points, if you're lucky, jumping around, that's just the background noise. Well, actually, the earthquake's already occurred now, it turned red, and now you're beginning to see the first waves arriving on the coast here and propagating in. The reds and uh, blues are the vertical displacements, and they're reaching amplitudes of plus or minus one meter. And the arrows are the whole movement of Japan and the deformation of Japan over the subduction zone towards the Pacific plate. And these are the sorts of things that nowadays are possible. Uh, the deformation field goes far beyond that. It extends well, it's extended well into China and in fact, the entire planet you can see it in GPS stations in Australia, for example, they were displaced at the time of that earthquake. And the hope is that out of these observations of these displacements, we can establish that whole earthquake cycle and the deformation fields. And then hopefully one day to use that as a uh, means of uh, predicting where and when earthquakes may occur. I'm going to wrap up very quickly now um, and I'll just show one important result that's also come out of the altimeters. You may have seen this here because Annie Kaznav, the director of the geoscience of the Earth Physics program here, is responsible for this sort of material. If she hasn't done so, we should ask her to give a talk on that because this is really very promising stuff. And essentially, the estimate from the altimeter of the global mean sea level over a 20 year period as measured by a succession of uh, radar altimeters. And this is the sort of result that gives rise to the observation that glo globally the sea levels are rising by about three millimeters per year, not uniformly, but up and down. You get periods where, no, let's go on. And more of greater interest rather than the mean is to see how this is spatially distributed. And I'll just show a very short part of this movie where we have monthly estimates of the actual spatial variation in the sea level. Red are areas where it's above normal, above the average, and red, uh, red is above and blue is below. And some of the main features which you'll see 
is this specific oscillation here associated with the El Nino events. But you'll see the Antarctic current, essentially just a lot of turbulent eddies moving along. You'll see the Gulf Stream, you see lots of other things. These pictures are sort of interesting to watch. I'm not sure by watching them, you, you learn necessarily a great deal of what we really have to do is find a better way of process, turning this information into actual knowledge. But anyway, you can see the pictures, the uh, periods where sea levels are rising above the average by 20 centimeters or more, and uh, other times in the same areas where it's 20 centimeters or, low, uh, or, or less below. And this becomes important for, in, particularly in the Pacific, with the very low lying uh, islands. You often read reports of sea level is rising, the, uh, my island has sunk. You never see the report that the island has risen again, but the next report will be that the island has sunk again. So these seasonal oscillations, to my mind, are at least as important as the long-term averages. And we need to have a much better understanding of that. Now I'm just going to, I'll show only this one and the next one, because that ties in with what I've said earlier. I said that we had the, this is the Goethe satellite developed by ESA uh, with the uh, with French uh, involvement for the accelerometers. And it was essentially designed to improve upon this gravity field model that we had back in the late 1960s, 1970s. And what has permitted the improvements that you'll see in a moment is the fact that the satellite has a drag-free system on board. It can go down to very low altitudes and it's the mice that was down up into within 200 kilometers of the Earth without being affected by the drag. The drag, the core of the satellite was shielded by, the, um, by a shield that was navigating and following the core. So it's a purely gravitational orbit. And just compare that result with this one here. Now, I should add, this result is for the harmonics from 16 to 280, so that has to be added to that result we just saw. But see the remarkable resolution. And I think for the first time from the satellite data, we are seeing really important geophysical signals that are going to help us understand what happens on the uh, Cape boundaries. Look, I'm sorry I've stepped over time. I thought I was pacing it well, but as usual, I haven't. Um, I had a series of conclusions. I'll try and write this up in, uh, in the next few days. Uh, it can be distributed. So I'll leave myself open for questioning and instead. First of all, thanks a lot for this journey in time, what geodetic precision has improved and scientific applications have emerged. Everybody's hungry. Thanks a lot for the next talk. And I would be interested in the follow up missions. Yes. Uh, Sorry, the which one? It is seriously interesting to have a consistent and uh, un, uh, uninterrupted time series almost. I mean, topics, then Jason, and then Andy's out of the right, and now the Sentinels are. Uh, this, this was one of the things I was going to address in my sort of summary of it, so thanks for the question. This is an extremely important problem. Uh, the European programs, the general programs, have all sort of tended to be one of the results of what is a very chance to sort of test the concept, etc. And same thing with the NASA program. So there's really no mechanism in place to provide a long-term secure observing system. I think this is going to become extremely important um, in today's political scene because during the last US presidential campaign, for example, it was stated that the Earth observing program is going to go and all the money was going to go to the space part. Now, I think that's being tempered somewhat, uh, but it demonstrates that the need to have a uh, long term continuity in this program because otherwise, the work of the last 10 years is going to be lost. This is going to be new. Yeah, we've learned something about those 10 years, but we can't say what will happen in the future. And uh, so the alternative, I think that's fairly secure, if the case is to follow up. 
distribution. Uh, I think that's uh, it's worth the time. And they summarize the number of long record, uh, the record of long observed periods. I think that program is sufficiently well embedded. The greater concern is the GRACE mission. Now, <clears throat> GRACE follow up, which is essentially left over bits from the first mission, so it'll be an identical one. I think it's still scheduled to go up sometime in the foreseeable future, 2018. And I haven't seen anything that suggests that it's going to be uh, cancelled. I think it's too small a one in a sense that it's passed under the radar. The next version, the uh, laser uh, interferometer, is on the design boards. It's in the queue for launch sometime in the future. I think that's going to be a very important one because one of the things I haven't been able to say is that a lot of the GRACE uh, it can be improved is essentially what I want to say if we want to get down to weekly type solutions for the ground field, if we want to really be able to separate the ocean surface from the equipotential surface to really look at that part of the sea surface that is driven by the currents, etc., by cylindrical changes, that sort of thing. That, that's critical to do that. So there are these problems. Uh, I think GPS and that type of thing it's probably pretty secure. But the thing that I was going to finish up on was just a comment on a proposal that's before ESA, I understand at the moment, and that is essentially a launch of a common problem, a program, a common platform of all the different tracking facilities that are important. A key issue at the moment is, and I think it's a limitation of what we're doing today, is that our different tracking systems have not been properly intercalibrated. And I think the differences that we see between laser results, GPS results, are of the order of centimeter type levels. And we cannot address fairly basic problems about where is the center of mass of the Earth, for example. Uh, what is the long-term drift in the GPS systems? And we need a, a platform with common instrumentation that can be used as an intercalibration of all these systems that has an altimeter on board, that has a um, gradiometer on board, for example, so that we don't have to go from one satellite here to the other to try and compare the tracking systems and to get that accuracy further down. So I think these are some of the issues that we need to at least you, the younger generation, needs to address. I'm out of it. Is there any proposal for a future mission with all these things on board? Well, there's a proposal before ESA, I understand, and you know more about this because I think you're one of the... Proposals are many on the way, but the yeah. process is not good. So I, think, I think there needs to be a support, a greater support for it from the community. Unfortunately, it's not the most exciting science. You know, it's not like flying through the rings of Cassini or anything that produces marvelous pictures, but it produces something that will underpin everything we do in the years ahead. It's the glue. It'll be the glue that ties everything together. And I think that's going to be very important. Okay, and let me just quickly add on this. So there are currently many efforts ongoing to bring this into operational programs on the European side with this Copernicus mm. program. That's essential, actually, and there was just recently a workshop where recommendations on this side have been formulated for exactly going in such a direction. Yeah. And that's really essential and currently not granted. Yeah. I think one of, I'll make an observation uh, on that, what I've seen so far. I think the mission, the proposal, needs a much stronger support from outside of the geodetic. The, the classical traditional geodetic community needs much stronger support from the earth science community as a whole. And I think that message has to be gotten out. Side. So you mentioned this famous Williamstown report with the really visionary mm. uh, statements what will be done in a couple of decades. Do you, what similar things do you see nowadays ongoing? Is there some sort of 
similar that we see that the civilians are recorded and put in emails in certain portraits. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I myself see where things are going. We, I, I, yeah. I have my limitations when it comes to understanding technologies and computational techniques, but I feel that we're being swamped by data and that we don't have enough time and not enough effort goes into trying to understand this data. I you know the perhaps it's a sign of becoming old fashioned or becoming that. Um, yeah, no, I'll leave it at that. I want to be overly. I, I think I think we need we almost need a period of a decade or so of some solid work with the data sets, with the type of data that we have, rather than look for yet new things. Because otherwise, you leave everything behind. But, you, know, you, you always go for the new thing. You leave the other stuff behind. We need a little bit of integration, I think. And I think the other thing that we need is a much better bringing in the rest of the Earth system science areas. As I've said, the, to my mind, the primary justification for the geodesy program is that it's sort of the unifying factor that ties the whole lot together. Yeah. Okay. Is there any last question? Before I shut it down. If not, then thanks a lot again.